I guess you've done this before. Use sandpaper to make rough wood smooth. Have a look at a piece of sandpaper. Stiff paper or cardboard and glued to that, there are thousands and thousands of tiny little grains of sand or pieces of glass or carborundum or some other very hard material. And those little grains scrape off the rough edges of the wood, making it smooth. When you've got it fairly smooth, you can shift to a finer grade of sandpaper to really polish it. Or, if you want to, you can use one of these, a sanding block. This is a block of foam plastic and it has coarse sand on one side, fine sand on the other. So you start the job this way, turn it over and finish it off like that. Well, I've invented a new kind of sanding block. Have a look at this. You might say, wait a minute, that looks like an ice cube. Yes, it is an ice cube, but when I was making these cubes of ice, I placed in the bottom of the tray lots and lots of little grains of sand and small rocks as well. So now I have a block that will actually work as a sanding block. Listen to it. It's actually scraping away the rough parts of the wood, making it smooth and wet as well. I don't know that I'd ever make a lot of money selling these because they'd melt in the shop before anyone had a chance to buy them. And anyway, I didn't invent sanding blocks of this kind. They've been around for millions of years, and most of them are very large. Imagine, if you will, a very large block of ice, larger than your car, larger than a house, larger than the street where you live. This is the largest block of ice I've ever seen and I'm trying to walk on it. It's actually a glacier. Now, what is a glacier? Well, I'm glad you asked. A glacier is a river of ice, and this is the Tasman Glacier, which is New Zealand's largest. In fact, it's the largest glacier in the Southern Hemisphere, apart from those at the Antarctic. And it's absolutely enormous. It starts here and goes down the valleys for 30 kilometres. And at its widest, it's three kilometres from side to side. At its deepest, 600 metres deep. That's two Empire State buildings, one on top of the other. How does it form? Well, it starts off as snow, loose snow. Now, if you've ever made snowballs, I know you've done this before. If you haven't, go to the refrigerator, scrape that loose stuff off from around the freezer and try this. Get a handful of that stuff and press it into itself like that. And very quickly, you turn loose snow into a solid block of ice, a snowball. Well, the same sort of thing is happening in the glacier. Because it's so deep, there are enormous pressures built up. And down below, the snow quickly turns into ice. But it's not just sitting here. The whole thing is moving. Now, how far is it moving? Well, normally they use posts as markers to measure the movement, but I'll use my hat. There, that's the starting point. In one week, the glacier would move about this far. So if we came back in a week's time, my hat and all the ice that it's sitting on would be down to this point here, about four metres in a week. The whole glacier moves from here down to the other end. The ice that's right at the start of the glacier there would take about 300 years before it gets right to the other end because it slows down quite a bit when it gets down to the end. Now this region of the glacier is called the Neve, the zone of accumulation, where ice is forming more rapidly than it's melting. And it's typically flat and smooth on the top, but not entirely. You see, because of those enormous pressures, deep down, the ice has become plastic or like plasticine. It can twist and bend and actually move over the rocks. But up on the top, it's quite brittle. And every now and then, in the Neve, you'll see a small crack opening up a crevasse, and these crevasses can get wider and wider, and the crevasse continues to grow until it's several metres wide and deep. If you're walking in a crevasse such as this, you have to tread very carefully. With each step, make sure that the ice is packed firmly before putting your full weight down on your foot. This crevasse may eventually become large enough to swallow a car or even a house. But the biggest and most spectacular crevasse of all is the Bergstrand. Bergstrand is a German word meaning big crevasse. And you find them at the top of glaciers. Now, just as some rivers begin with a waterfall, so some glaciers 
begin with an ice fall. Now you might say, wait a minute, there's no ice falling. If you look, you can see big blocks of ice just below the Bergstrand. And although they don't seem to be falling, they are slowly moving down the side of the mountain. Occasionally, one of those blocks will break away, causing an avalanche. <laughs> just as a river of water may start with a waterfall and then have rapids below that, where fast moving water tumbles over rocks, so at the top end of a glacier, you sometimes have smooth hills of ice where the ice is actually moving over enormous boulders below. So this section of the glacier is a little bit like the rapids of a river. This area of the glacier is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And besides the crevasses and the ice falls, there are other unusual features, such as this tunnel through the side of a crevasse. This would have started as a very small crack, and the wind whistled through that, causing more ice to melt and polishing the sides, making it grow larger and larger. And a wind tunnel such as this can eventually become large enough to ski through. What's all this got to do with sandpaper? Well, as the glacier moves, it picks up rocks and boulders and carries them with it. So the whole thing becomes a gigantic sanding block, carving out a U-shaped valley as it wears away the rock below. U-shaped valleys are often seen in mountains where glaciers have been. Eventually, we come to the bottom end of the glacier, where the ice melts, leaving behind rocks and rubble and fine sediment. This is called the terminal moraine. Not only do we get ice and snow avalanches at the sides of the glacier, but also we get rock avalanches. Now, what makes those rocks tumble down onto the glacier? Water. You see, if you get water into even the tiniest cracks in the rock, because of the low temperatures, it may freeze. And when water freezes, it expands, increasing pressure and actually pushing the rock apart. The cracks get wider, and eventually fragments of the rock may break off. In fact, that ice may cause entire slabs of the rock to fall apart, splitting rocks in halves, and all the bits and pieces of rock that fall onto the glacier are carried along as they would be by a conveyor belt. Some rocks left behind by the glacier are absolutely enormous. This is just one rock that I'm standing on, and it may have been dropped here thousands of years ago by the glacier when it melted in this area. It's called an erratic because it looks out of place. In fact, this rock may have been transported by that moving glacier, that river of ice, that conveyor belt coming down the valley from 30 kilometres away. And this is how the glacier ends up. Dirty water, rocks and pebbles. Why is the water dirty? Because whenever you get rocks scraping and grinding against other rocks, fine little particles are knocked off. Look at that, it's called glacial flour. And this river is absolutely full of it. But do you know what I find most amazing of all? This water in the river was ice 300 years ago. That's before white settlers came to New Zealand or Australia. It's long before the American Independence War. It's even before the French Revolution. What's even more amazing is if you want to see the ice that I was standing on at the top of the glacier turn back into water, you'll have to come back here round about 2300 AD. Curiosity.